This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. You know what we're going to do today? We're going to talk about the sexy NFL position. And we're not talking about the quarterback. Center? Guard? Nope. Nope, not the interior offensive line, big <laughs> Damn. Team. Uh, we're going to talk wide receiver, and we've talked wide receiver an awful lot leading up to the draft. Obviously, the Patriots drafted a wide receiver, and we've talked Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles. You know, we've had a lot of conversations about wide receiver, Greg. As I said, the Patriots draft one, one current receiver who was here last year. Let's start with Nelson Aguilar. He met with the media. He went back and forth with you guys. I saw a lot of uh, pretty cool quotes from him. Just first off, your impression of him and his approach to that media session with you guys. Yeah, Nick, I could uh, I could not have been more impressed um, with Nelson Aguilar. I thought that, um, you know, I came away feeling like better about myself, like more positive, like, (laughs) you know, Nelson, like, you know, changing the world. I know, you know, people are like, what, but art positive? What? And I don't know. But um, I was just really impressed for a kid who. Uh, look, you know, I wouldn't say he struggled last year. It was just it was just a difficult fit, and I think that we've we've talked a lot about it. Um, didn't put up the numbers last year that people expected, but I thought I thought he got a raw deal. I thought people were too critical of him. I don't think it was about him. I think it was about a sort of a confluence of factors that when you're talking about a deep threat boundary boundary receiver. A lot of things need to go right. And we knew that there were a lot of new pieces. Not a, Let's just start with the rookie quarterback. You know, let's start with, you know, a bunch of new receivers, whether it's, you know, Kendrick Bourne or what have you. Two new tight ends. Like, how are we going to incorporate things? Um, I thought that the pass protection was really iffy for at least half the season. And when you're talking about trying to take these shots, you kind of need good protection. And Mac Jones did not have that for a long time. So that would affect Nelson Aguilar. But... Um, I thought, you know, you we're looking at a kid who right now you look at it, they trade for Devontae Parker, they trade up in the draft for Tyquan Thornton. Both of those guys on paper should be competing for Nelson Aguilar's spot. And it leads you to think with his fifth, nearly fifteen million dollar cap hit this year, that's third on the team. Um, you know, does he have a future here in New England? Is he even gonna be on the team this year, or are they gonna look to trade him? or what have you. And most circumstances, when you're dealing with that, and I've dealt with it before, like I've gotten chirped by Deron Harmon, I've gotten chirped by Alandon Roberts, like, you know, different guy, Chase Winovich, you know, guys who you're like, well, I don't know where they fit and they could be traded. And, you know, they get defensive and I understand. They have families. This is their their well-being. I understand how you can get sensitive about it and sort of lash out. I mean, just look at Nikhil Harry. A year ago, I couldn't I couldn't help but think of Nikhil Harry listening to Nelson Aguilar, Nelson Aguilar talking about because I asked him point blank. I said I asked him about Devontae Parker and Tyquan Thornton and whether he thinks he fits or what have you. And he said, well, the first thing is this is the NFL. Every year there's somebody good in front of you or behind you. So the job is to compete. That's what you do. You compete. You compete, and then things are put into play. I'm in a good place because I have no problem with that. I compete, and I'm going to compete and put my best foot forward and show my value. Contrast that, that to, to Nikhil Harry last year, who the Patriots signed two wide receivers. They signed two tight ends. And what's Nikhil Harry's response? His agent requests a trade before they even start practicing. He taps out. So I don't want to compete. And, and I remember go, uh, ranting on this podcast about, dude, are you going to compete or what? Like, this is, you should step up. You should say, all right, fine, bring it on. And that's exactly what Nelson Aguilar did. So to hear him talk in those terms and talk about, you know, look, last year was my first year. I've learned so much. Love Mac Jones, all the positives about Mac Jones. Like, it was just, it was refreshing to hear. I was blown away by Nelson Aguilar. I had to write it up for for BSJ because he was so good. And um, it'll be very interesting to see what happens at the wide receiver position, which you know leads us into you know the topic of discussion today. Yep, we'll, we'll get into the details as far as wide receiver. I just want to make one note. You know, Aguilar is one of those guys, one of those second year guys with this team. And the philosophy, it seems like, is Belichick is banking on those guys he brought in last year to take that next step. 
and Aguilar could be one of them, right? We look at Janu, we look at Hunter Henry. Hunter had a pretty good, you know, freshman season, so to speak, especially with a, a freshman quarterback. Uh, so, you know, these, these second year guys, are they going to take that step to make this team inherently better? And maybe that kind of justifies a lot of the other stuff that they have or haven't done this off season. The jury is still out. Let's look at uh, the, wide Nick, I do think that's a good point and it's worth sort of flushing out a little bit because we talked about it at, you know, in the off season before free agency started. And I, and I wrote a column, but basically said, what if the Patriots just basically stand pat and, yep. You know, basically, I wrote like if you're Bill Belichick and you think you signed the right people last year, and I think for the most part they did. Maybe not all of them hit. Johnny Smith, I, I think we could put in the category of, I would say he has the highest percentage of he's not going to work out. Like it just, yeah. you know, but he could. But if you're Bill Belichick and you 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 had all that money, you studied, you were strategic in who you signed, like going after uh, after Nelson Aguilar, not some of the big you know, ticket items at wide receiver, um, signing Johnny Smith first at tight end, then saying, you know what? No one's jumping at Hunter Henry. We're going to give him the same offer and we're going to double up a tight end. You know, credit to Belichick. But if you're Belichick and you do that, have confidence in your evaluations that, you know, hey, this is not, free agency is not a one-year hit. It's not a one-year cure. It's normally the second year after you sign free agents where everything sort of melts. And that's what Nelson Aguilar was talking about. And and I think it was, I think it was wise on Belichick's part and, and you know, good, bet on yourself. Say, no, we made the right evaluations. We're going to give it a second year and then we'll see how it looks. And it also depends on the quarterback. Uh, it, look, mm -hmm. I think... All of us really like Mac. Some of us love Mac. But the idea is you drafted the right guy as well last season for the most pivotal position on the field. And if he takes that second year step, if he takes even a leap in the second season, then that will make everybody else around him better because he's better. So it's going to be fascinating to see how these players develop within the Patriot system from last year to this year. And whether it's a big jump, a small step, a step back, or they stay neutral, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Uh, all right, let's 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 dive into the uh, wide receiver position uh, detail-wise. Let's start with the uh, X candidates, X wide receivers. Greg, uh, you've got Devontae Parker, you've got Aguilar, Tyquan Thornton, you've got Harry, and you've got uh, Wilkerson there. Just kind of go through how you would break down each of those guys and how you see it fitting. Well, I think, I think Devontae Parker, you know, number one, he's – he's going to be the starting X left side boundary receiver in week one. Um, yep. They traded for him. He has a familiarity with the Patriots system, which gives him a leg up on, you know, some receivers like Aguilar last year, you'd say, well, we'll see how it goes because we don't know whether he's going to get it and how quickly he gets it and, and such. I, I think you, we can eliminate that with Parker. He's a smart guy. He's proven durability issues. We'll see if he makes it through camp and the preseason and all that stuff. But to me, Devontae Parker is the clear number one ex-boundary receiver for this team um, starting in week one. And then things sort of get interesting. I mean, I would say if I had just going off of what the roster is right now and not, not factoring in who performs well, injuries, all that stuff. It, and if I had to bet just today, I would say that it's starting opening lineup is – Devontae Parker, ex-boundary. I think that Nelson Aguilar is on the other side as sort of the Z. I think they start with both tight ends and one of the running backs. I think that's how they start the season. And, you know, that other spot. And then, so that's the two wide receiver set. Right. Now, if you go three, then I think it's Kendrick Bourne. And then I think you're in it. Then it's Jacoby Myers, Tyquan Thornton, that sort of thing. But to me... You know, Nelson Aguilar right now, I think Thornton's really going to have to flash early to push Aguilar off the roster um, before camp starts. Do you agree with that? I agree with that because, I, again, just thinking about the money, the investment, the idea that they wanted to bring this guy in and thought he could be a difference maker. And if Belichick, as you just mentioned a few minutes ago, is going to bet on himself and bet on his evaluation last year, I think they will give Nelson Aguilar every single opportunity that they can to win a starting gig. And they'll say, you know, we've got time with Taekwon. And if Taekwon takes a, makes a push here in the second half of the season, then great for us. And then we have a lot of options. We'll get 
you know, we'll get more into Tyquan Thornton in a minute because I, I found your breakdown to be interesting. And I watched some of the stuff that you've done. I saw the Greg Cosell podcast the other day. I watched that. And uh, I want people to hear your thoughts on Thornton and, and, and what he might be able to do here and, and how quickly he might be able to do it. But you've got Parker and Aguilar there. Of course, you've got Myers. Uh, you, you mentioned Kendrick Bourne. I, I want to touch on Kendrick Bourne. Where do you think he is the best fit for this offense, Greg? Because I, I think he's kind of – he's not a gadget guy, but he's very versatile. Yeah. And I kind of see, like, he's got a pretty high ceiling, I think, with this offense. I just – I love him as a player. What do you think they'll get out of Kendrick Bourne? And, and what do you think they're looking at uh, with him and, and their plan with him? How much will he be on the field? Where can he move around, et cetera? Yeah, I, I love Kendrick Bourne, and I think he's really going to you know bust out this year. I think we you know we saw signs of it last year. Here's here's the thing that's that's complicated for me, and a reason why I'm a little bit leery that Josh McDaniels is not here to handle this. And after a year with a lot of these guys, I think McDaniels would know exactly what he wanted to do, exactly how to script things. You know, I I, I love Jacoby Myers, but we've talked about it before. I. I don't love him in the slot. I don't think he's quick enough. I don't think, you know, he's a good possession receiver. That's great. It's great to have maybe on third down if you go three or four wide, that sort of thing. But I think what I think what the Patriots are going to do, or if I, if I were them, uh, I would sort of rotate through because they don't have any traditional slot guys. Like Nelson Aguilar does play in the slot, has played in the slot, but he's not going to make his living there. He's not big enough. He's, he, you know, he's more of a straight line guy. Kendrick Bourne is too small to make his living inside. He'll catch the ball inside. He'll do that, but he can't make his living there. And I think you also have, um, you know, you look at uh, a guy like Malcolm Perry or Ty Montgomery, the running back slash receiver. He can do some stuff. He's a thicker guy. Malcolm Perry, the undrafted guy from a few years ago, was with the Ravens. Navy, another ca- uh, gadget guy. Um, Trey Nixon, we'll see. He's on the roster fringes. But I think among those guys, I think the Patriots are probably going to rotate those guys in the slot, sort of, you know, have a pitch count for all of them because I don't, none of them can do it full time, but I think they can do it enough uh, to make it effective and to help this offense. So I think that, you know, I think that Kendrick Bourne is going to be, quote-unquote, your starting slot guy. But I think he gets like a series, then maybe it's maybe it's Aguilar inside, and they go with Thornton on the outside. I think there's going to be a rotation. I'm just a little bit worried about how that's all going to work under Joe Judge, Matt Patricia, Nick Cayley, instead of Josh McDaniels. But I think the problem is they have, they have a bunch of guys that are similar, uh, and out, but outside of Parker, nobody has a definitive position uh, among the wide receivers, and that can be a blessing, but it could also be a curse. All right, let's jump to the next guy, Greg, and, and I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago. You did some work on Tyquan Thornton, and I know before the draft, listen, you're not a draft Nick, right? You're not, mm-hmm. you're not the guy that's going to pour through hundreds of hours of film. <laughs> not even close. No, you, you touch on these guys. You take a look at some of their films, so you have a general feel about them. But then you kind of wait for the Patriots to make their picks. And then once those picks are made, you're going to dive in deeper because you know they're going to be on the roster now and you're going to be writing about those guys. So now that you've had a chance to watch at least a couple of Tyquan Thornton's games on film, first, just what did you see? Did did anything surprise you? Uh, Was anything better than you thought it would be? Was anything worse than you thought it would be? It's interesting because, like, uh, my what I wrote up about Thornton was almost identical to what Greg Cosell did before um, the draft when Greg Cosell was high on Thornton. And, you know, basically what I saw was, um, you know, the, the book on Taekwon Thornton from a lot of guys, you know, whether it's Chris Sims or, you know, other guys, there were a lot of guys, even guys who talked about it on the draft. You know, a lot of them said, fast guy. Can, you know, can get you some big plays, but inconsistent catching the ball, not the biggest guy, skinny guy, goes down easily on contact, things like that. Like, I'm not going to blow anybody or anything like that. But when I watched him on film, I saw, and I'm just going to do my own evaluation. I'm not going to counter other people's evaluations. I saw a guy who, all right, he's 428 speed. You don't really see that on the field. He's not that fast. 
He he does have the ability against man coverage, really good footwork, good handwork to get off of jams. Little difference between college jams and pro jams, so I still have a question mark about that. I thought he was much better on 50-50 balls uh, and competitive down the field than I thought. That's where he really stood out to me, where uh, there were plays, some of them that he didn't make, but he was right there. And he did make some play. There was one toe tap uh, sort of fade pass where unbelievable body control, um, getting roughed up a little bit, and he still made the catch, got two feet down, not even the one in college. And so I really, there was a lot more there than just a straight line. Dude's going to take the top off the defense. Um, A lot more there than that. He catches a lot of in-breaking routes, which tells me that the quarterback and the coaches trust him to do that in terms of his catching ability, his physical toughness, things like that. So I... I liked Twy- Ty Con- uh, Tyquan Thornton more than I thought I would on film um, from the brief, brief glimpses that I took of him before the draft. Um, you know, but I do still, to trade up in the second round, I do think that was a bit of a reach for the team. I think he could have been more of a third or a fourth round guy. Um, but I think he's a guy that can come in. He's going to have to compete. He looks like a smart guy on film. Uh, but, you know, I, I question how much he's going to pop as a rookie. He's going to start off being like fourth or fifth guy, give him a shot play now and then, and then it, then expand things from there. But I think there's a lot of tools there to work with. He's more well-rounded than people give him credit for, and I'm definitely intrigued by him. I think when people saw him, right, this always happens with, with Patriots fans and, and other fans too <clears throat> around the league. They they see somebody and it's like PTSD and they say like, oh, there's another Philip Dorsett or Bethel Johnson or Chad and, and all these older names. Well, just evaluate the individual player, uh, evaluate yeah. the individual talent. Don't wrap this guy. Don't throw him into the certain bucket because you can turn it into a hot take at the bar on Friday night. Like give this guy a shot and, and watch him. And, and I think, you know, like Greg said, that there's more to him than what some people just kind of threw out there. And as far as the reach, look, we'll, we'll never know. I, I think if he's an impact player, none of that matters. And inevitably, was one team going to take a swing at him and the Patriots thought we've got to move up? Obviously, yes. You know, I, I, the, the side, before we get back to Thornton and, and how big of an impact you think he could have reasonably this year, one sidebar just quickly from our draft coverage, it's all about Belichick intel and Matt grow. And, and you mentioned this last week, Greg, about the relationships that grow has versus who Ziegler knows and all that, you know, Belichick took some swings in the first two rounds. He drafted Cole strange at 29 when people thought he'd be there in the mid to late second round, at least he moved up a couple of spots to draft Thornton. You know, it, it'll be interesting to see if he was right on those players, but also he's been in the league forever. And, you know, was Belichick's Intel good enough that yes, they needed to move up to draft Thornton because Kansas city or Pittsburgh or some other wide receiver needy team was going to jump on him. We don't know the answer, but it it would be fascinating if we could have been a fly on the wall with those other teams. Did one of those teams really, you know, look at Thornton between 50 and 54 and say, he's our guy. Uh, As far as impact, Greg, reasonably, what should people expect from Tyquan Thornton rookie season? Uh, I, I think it would be reasonable to expect, uh, let's see, they play 17 games, you know, average, average about two or three catches a game. And I would expect some deep shots. So I want to see, um, I would say upwards ceiling, a handful of really big plays for this team. Certainly as he becomes comfortable, as they, as they go down, uh, the stretch in the season. Um, I think that, uh, that's reasonable. I wouldn't go nuts. You know, yeah, the Patriots put a little bit more pressure on the pick by trading up into the uh, into the second round to get him. But uh, look, they have to, we talked about Devontae Parker, Nelson Aguilar, Kendrick Bourne, Jacoby Myers, Ty Montgomery. These guys are all proven NFL players. I do think it's a very crowded receivers room, and I don't think everybody's going to be there, and Aguilar could be the odd man out. Um, depending on how things flash in training camp. But they don't need Tyquan Thornton this year to be great. Nelson Aguilar is not on the team next year, whether he's here or not. He has, he's, a, he's a free agent. So you're going to need to replace that deep threat. We've talked about the draft is 
free agency and the draft are both a year down the road. Maybe this is a pick for the future, but they need a little bit of bang this year out of that buck. And I think they'll get it. I think they'll get some big plays where, you know, Patriots fans get to get all revved up and think about him in the off season and how good he's going to be in year two, all that stuff. I think we'll get those, those fireworks. Just two more questions for you before we move on to the schedule that's set to come out on Thursday. Uh, who plays the slot? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's going to start sort of what I hinted at before. I think it's going to be a rotation. I think that you're going to see Aguilar, Bourne, Myers, Ty Montgomery. I think they're all going to get reps there. You know, maybe when push comes to shove, it might be Jacoby out there just because of his sure hands, that kind of thing. It's going to be a, a, a revolving door because they don't have one guy who's really physically built for that. And look at the the beating Troy Brown, Wes Welker, Julian Edelman have taken over the years. That's almost the, more important at that position than uh, your ability is just to, the, you know, to take a hit and get back up and stay in the game and stay in the lineup. That's been you know tremendous by Troy, Wes, Julian and uh, you know I think that they don't have that guy right now but if you limit your pitch counts I think there's a way to do it I'm just a little bit dubious that um, that Joe Judge is the guy to, to pull it off to wrap up the wide receiver talk we end where we began with Nelson Aguilar you brought up a pretty interesting possibility Greg in your notes he's got a 14.9 million dollar cap hit this year that's the third highest on the team it's the final year of his contract would it be bananas to think that the Patriots could actually extend him instead of trade him or, you know, just get rid of him? No. And, you know, here's why. The Patriots, as of today, have about $750,000 worth of cap space. And I'm yep. not even sure that includes signing their draft class. I don't, I don't think I don't it, think does. it does. I don't think it does. Yeah, so they're going to have to create cap space. I know people are like, oh, James Bradbury's going to be released by the Giants. How about the Patriots sign him? The Patriots can't even sign their draft picks at this point in time. And <laughs> as we've talked about before, Belichick has not shown any inclination to move cap space into the future. He's going to have to do it now. And it doesn't mean it's for James Bradbury. It means they're just trying to, A, sign their draft class, B, leave open enough cap space just to operate this year, just to get through the season with call-ups and injuries and all that stuff. You need another 4 to $5 million in cap space available just for the season. So, you know, we've talked about it. Matthew Judon, uh, Hunter Henry are guys that are that that could be restructured or extended to give you a lot of uh, easy cap money. Nelson Aguilar is a guy. If you extend him, add on a couple dummy years, yeah, you're going to have to take a cap hit whenever he leaves, maybe after the season. But uh, he's a guy that you know, he's, it's almost fifteen million dollars. All of a sudden, you give him that up front. And then you stack on two dummy years. Now, all of a sudden, his cap, cap number drops like $10 million. And right. so that's something that could be done. I don't think it means anything in terms of they're going to make a move and sign James Bradbury or Nelson Aguilar is the greatest wide receiver ever. They love what they, they heard in their press conference, so they're going to keep him here <laughs> forever. Now, I don't think it means any of those things other than the Patriots need cap flexibility. You heard it here first. Nelson Aguilar, Patriots Hall of Fame. Yep. Uh, let's jump into the uh, schedule release now. It's coming out on Thursday. I will tell people since I'm on the West Coast, yes, I absolutely plan to go to the Raiders game in Vegas. And yes, I plan on going to the Arizona game uh, later nice. on this year. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but let's look at it. Jets, Dolphins, Bills, Steelers, Browns, Raiders, Packers, Vikings, and Cardinals. Uh, before you rank and I rank my top three for the fans, just kind of your general assessment, Greg, of this of this uh, schedule and the overall challenge that it's going to present? Pretty tough. I mean, you know, I, I, I certainly, uh, the Raiders game is going to be hyped. I assume that's going to be some sort of primetime game. I mean, Josh McDaniels against the Patriots, you know, you can't script it any better. So uh, they, that's going to be a primetime game. It's going to be awesome. The Packers go into Lambeau, Aaron Rod probably the last time Belichick faces Aaron Rodgers ever in their careers. Uh, so that's another you know, uh, great thing. I don't know too much. You know, the Vikings are always competitive. The Cardinals, we'll see. I, you know, I, I think that it depends on when you get them. You'd rather have them late in the season, especially you want to late in the season because the weather here sucks in New England. So you want to go to Arizona and B, Kyler Murray's always beat up by the end of the season. So they're easier <laughs> to beat 
later on in the season than they are in like the first month and a half when he's always MVP of the league through like week four and week six. Um, and you know, the bills are brutal. Steelers are rebuilding, uh, but a great city and, uh, the dolphins, of course, that's always hell for the Patriots, but, uh, you know, good schedule. It's going to, I think it's tougher than last year. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see, uh, how things shake out on Thursday. All right. So for, for the top three of fans, um, you, you can mix in cities, you can mix in just, you know, the best games you'll think we'll see your top three opponents for fans, Greg. Okay. Well, number one, and I know I'm biased, but if I'm a Patriots fan, as soon as the schedule comes out, or you see a leak, the green Bay game, you know, you, yep. you have to see if you have not seen a game at Lambeau field. I mean, this, this is Bill Belichick's probably last trip to Lambeau. Probably. I mean, they won't be back there for another four years. I think it is. Um, you can it, you just can't beat it. I mean, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Hopefully, it's early on in the season and not in the winter. Uh, yeah. It's beautiful up there. September, October. Uh, you can fly into Chicago or Milwaukee. Uh, drive up there. Book your hotel as soon as the schedule comes out because it's impossible to get a hotel room in Northeast Wisconsin around Packers games. But you know, it'd be great to team it up. Hopefully, the Badgers are home on Saturday. Do a game, do a Wisconsin Badgers game on Saturday. Go to the Patriots game on Sunday or Monday. Uh, I love it. I you know, I live there. I covered the team. There's nothing like it. That's my number one trip. Yeah, I mean, I I think the Packers Lambeau Field, watching Aaron Rodgers play. Milwaukee is a sneaky, really fun city to hang out yep. in for. You know, a couple of days. I don't know if you want to hang out there for like a week, but uh, I made the trip one time with Kelly and we went to Milwaukee and Chicago and uh, we spent a couple of days in Milwaukee. Tons of fun, great food, great breweries, just a really cool feeling kind of town um, slash city. Uh, oh, and so, then yeah. basically you, you, the, the triple factor would be it's September. It's still baseball season. You do a Brewers game on Friday yep. night. You do Badgers on Saturday and the Packers on Sunday. That's that's an awesome fan trip. Hey, if it's in October, you can always go to, you know, the Bucks. a Bucks game on Friday night and watch Giannis in person. And I'll there tell is. you, you know, if you've seen Bucks games on television, the, the feel, the environment, the atmosphere outside of that Pfizer uh, building is, is pretty incredible. So uh, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great trip. Green Bay. Um, I also think Vegas is, you know, Vegas is in my top three because first of all, yes, it's Vegas. But secondly, Allegiant Stadium, which I haven't visited yet, but, you know, Allegiant looks like it's an incredible, incredible uh, stadium. And they've got a lot of weird, quirky Vegas things they do during like home games and stuff. So I, I think the Raiders would be a lot of fun. And of course, you'd also I think it's going to be a primetime game, which will be which will be fun as well. And, and you've got the Josh McDaniel storylines and and the Raiders are a talented team. They, they got a lot of you, you'd be able to see Chandler Jones play. You'll be able to see. uh you know, Derek Carr and this and Devonte Adams and that offense. So I think the Raiders would be a fun game. And I think obviously Vegas is Vegas. And with that stadium, that's, that's a nice little trip. Yeah. Vegas is my number two for, you know, all the reasons that you said, I mean, you know, I, you know, I've done that trip a few times. It's a little bit of a long flight, but at least you could fly direct there from just about anybody, anywhere. The hotels are very reasonable. You can always find something in your price range. You don't need to stay at, you know, a big casino. You can stay, you know, sort of off the strip. Um, so that makes it cool. Uh, the weather, you know, you could get some golf in that weekend if the weather's really good. And, and that yep. sort of leads into my number three for me. And Minnesota would be there. It depends on what time of year. If it's September and I can go to Target Field and see a Twins game, which I've done, which I highly recommend, and I can do a, you know, sort of a twofer, then Minnesota might slip into my number three. But my number three for now is Arizona just because of the weather. You can play golf, different lodging options. Again, a long, very long flight from Boston. But it's worth it if you're going to knock out a couple days and enjoy the weather. I might go Cleveland, depending on the uh, depending sneaky, on the time. Yep, sneaky. I'm okay with it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I've I've never been to Cleveland. That's one of the reasons. But the other reason is, as you just said, sneaky. I've heard it's a sneaky, really fun city, and and people kind of from the outside looking in, you go Cleveland. But I've heard it's a hell of a time. And before, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this: before twins, before we had our twins, Rita and I 
uh, we would go, we would pick a Red Sox road trip every year and go. And one of the ones that we were able to sneak in before the twins were born was Cleveland. And we did the rock and roll hall of fame. Uh, Awesome. There are some cool, we stayed at like a Renaissance right near the, the baseball park. If you could also double up baseball and football, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's Cleveland's awesome. I had a blast there. Good food too. Yeah, and, and you might see Deshaun Watson play if he's actually playing. So <laughs> yeah, uh, that team should be should be fun with him if he, if he's out there. All right, let's jump to the BostonSportsChannel.com member question of the day. BSJ thirty nine ninety nine on the annual plan. Top notch analysis, of course. Celtics with Corrales, who's killing it. Uh, if you Patriots junkie like you are, of course you can. Follow along with Greg in his video analysis. He just put something up on Tyquan Thornton. Direct access to him in, in weekly chats. Don't forget Connor Ryan doing uh, doing the uh, Bruins coverage, and you know Sean doing the uh, awful, awful Red Sox at this at this current situation and juncture. Uh, Pat's Jam, what's up, Pat's Jam? Here's the question, Greg. Were you surprised on Greg Cosell's thoughts on Jermaine Johnson? I thought the player was good, but like you, somewhat one dimensional and a bad fit for the Patriots discipline scheme uh, was surprised. He liked him versus the run. If true makes the jets draft something to really pay attention to the next few years. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, real quick uh, for those BSJ members uh, listening, uh, just to let you guys know, we just did a system revamp something uh, that should have been happening. Wasn't happening. we just did, we updated the software and some of you, who uh, your subscriptions lapsed, uh, you probably now are finding that you do not have access to the site. So you need to go in and re-up your subscription uh, if you would be so kind to do. Um, or just you know make sure you fill out a support ticket and I'll take care of it um, when I can. So Jermaine Johnson, yes, I was surprised past jam at Greg Cosell's uh, comments. Uh, he was very high on Jermaine Johnson, thinks he's an excellent run stopper right now and thinks he has upside as a pass rusher. I thought he wasn't the Patriots type of guy. I didn't take a look at him because I thought he was going top 15. Um, I I thought that he was more of a pin his ears back, go up, run by the quarterback type of guy that wouldn't fit here. But Cosell does not think that's true at all. He thinks that he, he, he actually said that he expects Jermaine Johnson in three years time to be the best edge guy out of this draft. And if it makes the Patriots passing on 21 or even was he available at 29? I don't think he was. Uh, no, no. The no. Jets jumped in. I think it was 26. They jumped into draft. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, that's, I think that's right. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it makes it even more is another name to add to the list on now. Uh, they could have had him at 21 and what did they do trading down to 29 and taking Cole strange. Uh, but you know, yeah, you look at the jets, they could have the best cornerback in the draft sauce Gardner, they could have the best wide receiver in the draft in Garrett Wilson, and they could have, according to Greg Cosell, the best edge guy in Jermaine Johnson. If that's true, I mean, you know, look out for the Jets, but Nick, I'm sure we can both agree, uh, when it comes to the Jets and knocking it out of the park in the draft, we'll believe it when we see it, when it actually happens, uh, because it never happens, which is why they're the Jets, but... Uh, yeah, I was surprised at that. And it makes, uh, makes me want to look a little bit harder at Jermaine Johnson when we see him twice a year. And hopefully he's not wrecking Mac Jones in the backfield because that would be <laughs> awkward. Uh, and if you, if you care about the running back position, you could argue they had the number one running back in the draft too, and Brees Hall. So oh, just yeah. by, you know, talent evaluation wise, uh, the Jets looked like they absolutely hammered this draft. And, you know, Joe Douglas, we'll see, like you said, Greg, the jury is going to still be out on those guys until they actually get out there on the field and play. I would also say just a gigantic season for Zach Wilson. He was up yep. and down last year. He had some clunkers. I mean, he stunk against the Patriots, um, you know, and, and there's going to be higher expectations for Zach and Douglas has gone out on the record and in front of the media and, and said that, you know, he believes that Zach Wilson can pretty much be a special talent at the quarterback position. So we'll see as we talk about guys taking that step in year two for the Patriots. We'll see what Zach Wilson looks like for the Jets in year two as well. Uh, he's Greg. I'm Nick. It's the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles. Let's everybody have a great weekend. Be well, be good, be safe. Uh, we'll be back next week. He's Greg. I'm Nick.